All right, guys, looks like we're live. So <clears throat> this is Len, and here I am. I'm recording, I believe, what's going to be episode seven of Grappling with Theology. Um, I'm recording here on YouTube. I am also recording on GarageBand so that I have the raw version in case anything goes wrong with the live podcast here. So uh, with that being said, I do need to pull up GarageBand here, don't I? So give me just a second here, and I have to do a little prep work here. Edit. We're going to cut. All right. Edit. Cut. Edit. Sorry, guys. I know this is not the exciting thing about the podcast. I just want to make sure everything's going well. So edit and whoops. Cut. All right. So I think, I think I'm ready here. So I'm just going to drag and drop my garage band down here. There we go. Hey, I got six viewers. What do you know? So, like I said, Grappling with Theology is live. And just to share with you a little bit more about uh, Grappling with Theology, you should know that Grappling with Theology is brought to you by Deus Fight Company. Deus Fight Company is the official sponsor, a official sponsor of Grappling with Theology. And life is a fight, y'all, whether physical, mental, or spiritual. Deus Fight Company's gear is the first faith-based fitness brand for the Christian mixed martial artist and BJJ practitioner. Gear is high quality, and it's been proven on the mats, my mats, in fact, the mats in my academy, because I wear a Deus Fight gi, as does my daughter, and I got another one coming, which I'm really, really pumped about. Their gis and gear is high quality. And Deus Fight Company also helps you share the gospel. Their geese are geese with a mission. Portions of their proceeds go to help support ministries all over the world. If you're looking for a brand that can help you share your faith, then look no further than Deus Fight Company. Go to www.deusfight.com and use coupon code GWT, that's Golf Whiskey Tango for you military folks, and you'll get a 10% discount on your purchase. Now, don't forget, Grappling with Theology is, of course, a member of the Bible Thumping Wingnut Podcast Network. And if you're watching this on Bible Thumping Wingnut's YouTube channel, you know that. So BTWN is Orthodox Christianity's marketplace of ideas. Go to BibleThumpingWingnut.com. Check out the multitude of podcasts and blogs on that platform. For your edification and enjoyment, of course. And don't forget about our friends at Wrath and Grace. Wrathandgrace.com, Christian apparel, hip-hop, books, and custom screen printing. If you need custom screen printing, then Jay at Wrath and Grace is happy to help you out. Go to wrathandgrace.com. Check them out. Um, you can email me at grapplingwiththeology at gmail.com, and I hope you do. Send me your questions, comments, etc. cetera. Uh, maybe I'll look at emails today. So what is on the table for today's show? Well, first I'm going to show you five videos. Five videos to show your friends who are thinking of trying BJJ. Uh, I am also going to go through this book, uh, chapter one of Christian Beliefs. Christian Beliefs is a great summary, 20 things every Christian should know. And so this is a summary of our faith, and I'm going to go through chapter one, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is all about the scripture. And what else am I going to go through? Let me see if I have any emails here. 
Let me just see if I have any emails that I can share. It would be cool if I did. But, you know, we're just getting off the ground here. So, you know, most of the people I know who do jujitsu um, and are Christians are more theologically astute and better at jujitsu than me. So <laughs> maybe I'm not the person to ask those questions. Of, you know what I'm saying? So let's see here. Let's see if Grappling with Theology has any emails to go through. Oh my goodness. I have questions from the dojo. So, and one of them is, of course, trying to sell stuff. So, anyhow. No questions from the dojo. Um, so let's just get into it, everybody. So I want to go through this video. Hold on a second. Let me start. Let me start actually recording here. All right. So today what I want to do is I want to play a video for you. And if, you, uh, if you're just listening to this on the podcast feed, whether on iTunes or your Android device, you can go to the link in the podcast description and watch the video version of this podcast. It'll be a little bit different, especially on the front end, um, but I do want to share with you something that I think is super, super helpful. Like I said, the point of this show, the point of this podcast is so that people in the church would come to understand my passion for jujitsu and maybe even try it for themselves. So people in the church, I want to try, uh, I want them to try and learn. And for those who are in jujitsu, but not in the church, I want them to come to know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, be saved from their sins. And uh, so those are, that's the whole point of grappling with theology. So today, I want to show five videos. There's, it's actually from jujitsutimes.com. It's called, this article is called to show your friends who are thinking about trying jujitsu, thinking of trying BJJ. This is an article by Jerry Sui from January 4th of 2016. So this is not a recent video, yet it's relevant. So let me, let me just start reading from the article here, and then I'll share screens and show you f four of the five videos. One of them is unavailable. So to the article, if you train Brazilian jiu-jitsu, there is a good chance you have had a friend or coworker express interest in learning more about the gentle art. If you have trained for a few months or even been an avid fan of the UFC, you can easily forget how intimidating the thought of training in martial arts can be for the average person on the streets. There are many misconceptions about, about martial arts and BJJ, since many will associate it with the most violent highlights from the UFC, while not realizing the physical, mental, and spiritual benefits from training. Whether your friends want more information about BJJ or just needs a little bit more convincing before trying out a class, these five videos will help you, will help show, I'm sorry, let me start over again. Whether your friends want more information about BJJ or just needs a little bit more convincing before trying out a class, these five videos will help show them why BJJ is a great workout, sport, and a way of life for its practitioners first video here. Okay, in the video below, Henner Gracie breaks stuff BJJ and why it works as an effective form of self-defense on the feet and on the ground for a smaller and weaker person. If your friend is on the fence about trying tra about training, this video will help sell your friend on the mental and physical benefits and practicality of BJJ. All right, so let me share my screen here with y'all. And, all right, I'm just going to expand this video and click the play button for you here. My name is Henry Gracie and I'm a third generation jujitsu instructor of the legendary Gracie family. Today we're here to talk about self-defense because every man must know how to protect himself and his family.
when it comes to self-defense, it's crazy because when I meet people or I interact or I see someone on the street who asks me about jujitsu, I encourage them to take up learning self-defense or jujitsu. It's fascinating because the, the, the number one response I get from regular people is, Henner, I'm a lover, not a fighter. In other words, I don't need to pick fights. I'm not looking for fights. I'm not trying to get in fights. And uh, therefore, why should I learn how to fight? And what's crazy is that they have it all backwards. They're completely backwards in how they're thinking about it. My mindset is this. Who are the people who are picking fights? Who are the people who are out there puffing their chest? Who are the people bullying other members of society? Those are the people who do not believe in themselves. Those are the people who feel that they have something to prove. So if you aren't confident that you can't defend yourself and you aren't confident that you can hold your own in a real life situation against a larger, more athletic opponent, naturally, you're going to question yourself. And in questioning yourself, you're going to tend to do things more aggressively and, and more quickly than if you knew with 100% certainty that you could protect yourself and your family. So the irony is the martial artists, the trained martial artists are the people who are least likely to ever get into a fight. If you ask me how many street fights I've been in in the last 10 years, the answer is zero. Now, how many have I neutralized? How many have I avoided? And how many have I been able to walk away from and calmly assert myself in and prevent because of my jujitsu capabilities? The answer is all of them. My mindset is learn how to fight so you never have to. Because once you're 100% certain of your self-defense capabilities, you can assert yourself, you can remain much more calm, and, and you know that at the end of the day, should someone attack or something get out of hand, you can easily neutralize the situation without a problem. Now, when it comes to actual self-defense and building the skills necessary to protect yourself should an attack occur, it's, uh, it's amazing how, how, how many misconceptions there are about you know, jiu-jitsu. When someone who has no knowledge of martial arts hears the term jiu-jitsu, they think it's the same as karate or taekwondo or kung fu or any other traditional martial art. And, uh, and it couldn't be further from the truth. The idea is very simple. Traditional striking-based martial arts the idea is you stand in front of your opponent, should the fight occur, and you trade punches and you trade kicks uh, for as long as is necessary until one person gets the, 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 be the, the, the better end of the bargain and is able to connect with, this, with a powerful kick or a powerful punch and is able to incapacitate the other person. Now, the risk in that strategy is that every time you throw a punch or you throw a kick, you're within range to get punch or kick in return. The idea of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is not to stand in front of someone and trade blows to see who's more athletic or who's stronger. It's to basically manage the distance in the fight. The idea is very simple. You wanna be all the way out, too far away to be struck, or you wanna be so close that any strikes that are directed at you are not effective and cannot knock you out. So it's all about distance management. You wanna be all the way out or all the way in. What's interesting is this principle applies both standing up and if someone does not know jujitsu when the fight goes to the ground, naturally they're going to waste exuberant amounts of energy trying to strike at the other person unsuccessfully, and they essentially burn out very rapidly, giving the opportunity for the trained jujitsu practitioner to take advantage of the opportunities that they create, the mistakes that they make, and ultimately win the fight with a joint lock or a chokehold. The way we look at it is this. Normally, the way fights are fought is you have one person, this is us, let's just say, the smaller, weaker individual, who is, you know, gets into a fight with a larger, more athletic opponent, okay? Typical street fight situation. This person is challenging or, or basically picks a fight with us. Normally, the way street fights are fought is both people go crazy, burning their energy at a rapid rate because neither one of them knows what to do. And the smaller, weaker individual runs out first because they're smaller and weaker, and the bigger person wins the fight. The secret to Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is that we perfect the techniques that force the big guys to burn, while we chill and they burn and they burn and it doesn't take long 30 seconds a minute a minute and a half once the larger opponent is fully exhausted then we can win the fight with a joint lock or a chokehold or we can get away from the fight unbruised unbeaten safely go home at the end of the day and if you ask my grandfather you know grandmaster Edu, you know against those giants how did you how did you win those fights against those giants that you fought his response was always the same. He said, I never defeated any of my opponents. My opponents defeated themselves. The way you have to look at it is, if you get into an altercation with someone much heavier, much stronger, much more athletic than you, and nobody wins the fight. Let's say you get into a fight against a more a powerful individual and nobody wins the fight. You won the fight.
because you survived and both you went home at the end of the day. And because you were at the disadvantage and you were supposed to lose the fight, and that didn't happen because it was an equal a draw, nobody goes to the hospital, nobody got beat up, and nobody won, you won the fight. In my eyes, in my grandfather's eyes, and in the eyes of anyone who has any kind of sound logic in their approach. So most martial arts, uh, in my opinion, should be called self-offense because someone aggresses towards you and your way of defeating them is to overcome them and overpower them and you know, uh, essentially overwhelm them with powerful strikes and athleticism and aggressiveness. You're neutralizing their attack, but you're imposing an attack and aggression of your own. So, so you eventually go from being the attackee to the attacker. Gracie Jiu Jitsu, on the other hand, is 100% pure self-defense. If someone attacks me, I'm only going to use as much force as is necessary to neutralize the attacker. And as soon as the situation is under control, and as soon as the, 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 there's no more immediate threat to me or someone else, the damage, the control, the, the, the imposition of techniques and force against that person stops right away. And some of you will say, well, if I get into a street fight, what's the importance of having that restraint and the technical ability to control and neutralize someone without hurting them? And man, the benefits are limitless. I mean, in a society where everyone wants to see a single thing that goes down, you can imagine that if someone picks a fight with me on the street and all I knew was to bloody his face with punches or kicks, you know, especially me being who I am and, and you being who you are. You know, you're going to get sued the next day if you brutalize someone and break their face open. With jujitsu, you don't have to do that. You control the situation, neutralize the aggressor, negotiate from inside the fight. Once they've calmed down and the threat has been neutralized, the fight is over. You get up, you shake hands, and you go on with your day. It's very simple. Or you're at a kid's birthday party, and, you know, Uncle Jim is getting crazy. He's drunk, acting out of control, and you've got to, you know, apprehend or control this guy because he's doing stupid things, but you don't want to bloody your uncle at the kid's birthday party. Guess what? Gracie Jiu Jitsu to the rescue. So not every fight is a life or death, you know, fight to the finish. And most of them aren't. So in those situations, there's no art that's more effective at giving you the ability to calmly restrain the individual, control the situation and do so in the least violent way possible. And uh, if it is a life or death situation, we got that handled as well. Gracie Jiu Jitsu is our family's self-defense system that has been used to defeat giants for the last 85 years. Today, we have specialized, amazing programs for men, women, and children. Gracie Bullyproof, teach kids how to assert themselves verbally against the bullies, and if attacked, how to neutralize the situation without throwing a single punch or kick. Women, women empowered, 15 techniques to defend against sexual assault. All right, so I paused it there just because the rest of this video is basically a, <clears throat> an ad for for the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy, which, by the way, I don't have a problem with. I, I would highly recommend the, Dra the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy. I, I think my academy, though not officially affiliated with Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, is definitely, uh, it's definitely a Gracie philosophy in terms of its Jiu-Jitsu. So next, the net, going back to the article here, it says Henner's uncle Hoist Gracie became a BJJ and MMA legend by accepting challenges against practitioners of other martial arts. In the video below, Kung Fu expert and future UFC fighter Jason DeLucia traveled to the Gracie Academy in Torrance, California in the early 90s to challenge Hoist to a fight. In the video below, Hoist uses his grappling techniques to control and submit a larger striker and to show the effectiveness of BJJ compared to other martial arts. This Kung Fu expert wearing yellow trunks has 15 years of training and claimed to be undefeated. At 180 pounds, he had a 15 pound advantage over my brother Hoist. The Kung Fu men will rely on strikes in order to avoid going to the ground. It is almost impossible for a person trained primarily in punches and kicks to avoid being wrapped up and taken down by a Gracie Jiu Jitsu practitioner. Hoist is determined to close the gap and take the fight to the ground. As they go to the ground, he grabs Hoist by the neck. Hoist will establish his position before getting his neck out of the hold. He repeatedly hits his opponent on the ribs forcing the Kung Fu man to let go. He maintains the top position.
the legwork of the Gang Fu representative reveals that he is not knowledgeable in the intricacies of grappling. Hoist is taking the time to study the situation and ride the opponent. At this point, Hoist could easily apply a chokehold and finish the fight, but he elected not to. There are many variables when it comes to ground fighting. Through a systematic step-by-step -step approach, we have organized it into a science. The opponent is obviously in good shape. When Hoist applies this choke with the legs around the neck of the Gung Fu expert, he has absolute control. Instead of finishing the fight, he applies just enough pressure to prevent his opponent from getting away. He can take his time and chooses where to hit. The Kung Fu representative is totally helpless. Not only he's running out of air, but he cannot stop the blows. It's a terrifying feeling. All right, so that was Hoist Gracie against a Kung Fu practitioner. Important to note that the first, the philosophy of uh, jujitsu laid out by Henner in the previous video uh, talks about going against untrained. Basically, in a street fight, the chances of running against somebody who's trained is really unlikely because trained people just don't tend to fight in the streets or they they certainly don't start fights okay they they go to the dojo and they they have nothing to prove they've proven it on the mats day in day out in their regular training so they have no need to go out there and uh start fights so this one was a really good example of the effectiveness of jujitsu against um against trained opponents that it's superior in that case to kung fu so the next video is not available, um, but you can go on YouTube and look up um, Hoist Gracie and his fight in UFC 1 against Ken Shamrock. Again, another trained fighter and a trained grappler, by the way. Um, so, yeah, okay, just back to the article here. Um, at UFC 1, Hoist Gracie wrestler and shoot fighter Ken Shamrock, who outweighed Hoist by 30 pounds and looked like a Greek god. Hoist looked like the average guy on the street showed how technique and skill can conquer size and strength. The video below highlights how BJJ is a great equalizer in self-defense situations for smaller and less athletic individuals who are trained in the art. So again, no video to show you there. It was taken off of this video. But again, with jujitsu, it's not about strength and muscle and, you know, being able to out to to overpower your opponent it's about skill and technique so go watch that video on youtube just just search hoist gracie versus ken shamrock ufc one they fought probably three or four times um, but the first one is the the best one by far so the next video um which for some reason oh there we go so the next video, this is going to be listener discretion advised. I'm not going to bleep out everything here. But back to the article. Podcaster, comedian, and UFC commentator Joe Rogan has been one of the best marketing tools for BJJ for the past decade. He's a lifelong martial artist, former Taekwondo champion, and holds BJJ black belts from Eddie Bravo and Jean-Jacques Machado. In the video below, Rogan talks about how BJJ positively impacted his life, introduced him to amazing people, and made him a better and stronger human being. So again, I'm going to play this video, but again, this is listener discretion. There are some uh, F-bombs in here that I want you to be aware of, and uh, I don't have the time or the inclination to bleep it all out, but the information that's shared in here, if you can get around that stuff, is very true so here is the video of 
Joe Rogan talking about the benefits of learning BJJ. Yeah, let's do that. You should do jujitsu, man. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. Fuck yeah, man. Been, Get in there. I love it. A lot of uh, I love doing it, going man. through my head. I, I've been thinking about it. My problem is I'm not around anywhere. I, I don't know. You like, take it on the road. I'd be, I'd be at the brand new. I'd be the fucking punching bag every. Yeah. I'd be yeah, Daniel's son good for every you. day. Yeah, it's good for you. It's good for you to get your ass kicked. Really? Yeah, it's good for you to know how easy it is for a man to kick your ass, too. I it's good for you. Yeah. It's good for you to get destroyed. It's good for you to get mounted and sh- triangle choked and shit. It's good because you realize how easy it is for someone to do that to you. Because most people have no idea. They walk through this world having no idea I agree how 100%. some Marcelo Garcia character could just fucking take your life anytime he wanted to. And I not agree. just take your life. How about this? How about take my life? How about I've been doing jujitsu for since 96 and that little dude from Brazil could strangle the fuck out of me any day he wants. That's that's reality. And I'm almost a black belt. I'm like high level. There's a lot of people I've choked out. I can choke out some good people, man. And that guy could just tap me anytime he wants. So for me to be like almost a black belt, I might as well have never done jujitsu. I'll just be able to hold him off for a little. He's yeah. going to get me. It's inevitable. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the kind of reality that exists for most people. If you know jujitsu for most people, if you're in some sort of a street altercation with someone and you get a hold of them, that's all you have to do. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Hang on. Because you know what? In class, in class, you're going 100%. 100%. Are you serious? Yeah. You know why? Because you don't hit each other. You're trying to choke and grappling. And grappling, you're allowed to go 100%. doesn't mean you hurt your, your partners. If you have a lock or if you have a choke, you, you put it to a certain position and you can just hold it and let it go. But the point is it takes 100% of your effort to get to that position. And that's exactly what's going to come up in a fight. In a fight, it's going to be 100% effort, except you're used to doing 100% effort three, four nights a week. Yeah. Three, four nights a week, I go and there's grown men and they're going to try to kill me with their bare hands and I'm going to try to kill them. And then we're going to slap hands and we hug and I say, thank brother. And we move on to the next guy and you, you, you go to the next one. The next one, you tap hands, you, 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 know, you go, you slap hands. That's what everybody does. And then you lock up. And this is the goal. I'm going to try to get you to tap. And what you're saying when you tap is you could have just killed me. And then you're going to try to do the same thing to me. And if you get me in something, I'm going to have to tap. And I'm not going to want to, but I'm going to have to. It's very important. You don't want to die. That's a missed, that's a missed <laughs> opportunity in my life right there. Just do it. Henzo. Henzo, Henzo uh, Gracie? Henzo was, told me. He was like, come on out to the to, to the place, uh-huh. and, and I will te- we'll teach you jiu-jitsu. Sure. And Why don't you like, do it? It's a game. And yeah. the game is using your body to dominate another person's body with technique and leverage. I want to do it. I want to do it because I, I'm a, there, I have so many anxieties of just – it's the reason I want to get a fucking massive dog. Yeah. It's the reason I want to fucking live in Montana. It's the reason I want to right. buy a shotgun every time I'm in Iowa. Right. It's like the fu- – I just – it's the reason I drink on planes. It's I just am afraid like – like uh, You're afraid of a fight on a plane? Uh, today, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fucking guy fucking <laughs> jumpsuit how many by the way before we get started how many fucking fight stories have ever been started by this fucking guy <laughs> all right well again apologies for the language there but <clears throat> if you can get past that it, it's really important to note a lot of the things that um that were said uh okay so it's important to know, for example, um, it's important to know that you can be dominated by another human being. It's important for men, especially to know that men whose job it is to take care of their family and be the protector and provider. It's important for them, for a man to have the humility to know that another man could, could do some serious damage to you. And so there's this, this thing in the community of like the tactically astute people who, you know, talk about guns and, and uh, not prepping so much, but it's called situational awareness and emotional fitness. One t- situational aware- awareness is to um, know what's going on around you, to not be, you know, tied into your phone and giving that 100% of your attention while someone is intending to, you, to do you and your family harm. That makes you a target. When you're like this, people who are perpetrators look for that. They look for that trait in you. And the other thing is um, emotional fitness. Emotional fitness is to be... So if you're getting physically dominated, how do you handle it in that moment? Do you panic? Do you... What do you do? It's Emotional fitness is how you handle that, how you weather the storm if you will. Jiu-Jitsu will teach you that. 
So um, there's one last video to show, and that is of this young lady. Her name is Riley Breedlove, and I'm looking for the for the video here. It's kind of weird how it's coming up, but Riley Breedlove is a female BJJ practitioner, and she is one of the reasons, this video in particular, is one of the reasons why I got my daughter into training. Back to the article here. It says, Riley Breedlove is a beast. I often get asked by parents if BJJ would be good for their young daughters. As stated above, BJJ can be a great equalizer for smaller and weaker individuals in a self-defense situation. Riley is an amazing competitor and shows off her skills against members of her high school wrestling team in the video below. In interviews, Riley is composed, confident, and articulate. Training in an individual sport like BJ problem-solving skills, overcome adversity, and dealing with winning and losing, which are all important life skills. By the way, I agree with all those things. Um... I think it's actually Joe Rogan who said that all jujitsu is, is it is high level problem solving with dire physical consequences. So with that, I am going to actually mute this uh, audio because it's very, very poor. And I'll kind of talk through the commentary. So she's going against her high school, uh, different individuals on her high school wrestling team. So you can see here she has a Russian collar tie. She jumps guard. And she's immediately going to like a rubber guard situation and throwing in a triangle choke. A triangle choke, now an arm bar. I don't know if the choke or the arm bar got him, but it was both. Now she is in a mounted position and she goes for a belly down arm bar. And she is an absolutely dominant force. She's probably outweighed by these guys by anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds, I would imagine. But here's a guy going for a low ankle pick, and she sprawls. He gets the ankle, but for some reason, he goes to his back, and she gets an anaconda choke right here, flips out of it. He gets back to a, a decent position, but he's wrestling, trying to tie up her legs and get her on her back. A jiu-jitsu practitioner does not mind being on her back. There's a triangle choke locked in nice and tight, and she does a razor lock, which is an, an arm bar on the elbow right there. And gets him to... No, he didn't submit to that, actually. He's doing a good job defending the arm bar. She could probably finish the choke here by pushing his arm across. But here she is stretching out the arm and she gets the arm bar there. Okay, so here she is in guard of larger kid on top of her. Now, one thing I want to note here. If you have a daughter, this is like the nightmare position. If a boy wanted to hurt your daughter and rape her, this is like the nightmare position to be in. But for the jiu-jitsu practitioner, this is not an uncomfortable position. That closed guard. And here she is going for another choke. She's got worked up to high guard, and she's going for a triangle choke, turning over the elbow. And he hasn't tapped yet. But he should, if he were smart. Um, she has a triangle choke locked in with his left arm in, and his left arm is kind of hugging around her thigh. So she rolls over, uh, starts to mount him, and then goes back to her back. Looks like she's trying to get that arm out. But she's putting a razor lock actually on the freed arm, his right arm, and got the arm bar out of that. He taps, and he is on his back, exhausted, wondering what the heck just happened to me. Now, here she is. She pulls guard on another individual, and she's working an arm bar here. He rolls over on his back. That just made things worse. He's trying to clasp his hands together desperately, but her, um, she's closed over on him to get that arm bar, and this is just game over. If he doesn't tap to the arm bar, she's pulling right there to a triangle choke, keeping that arm tied in. And she keeps kind of going back and forth from armbar to triangle to like a, an Americana kind of thing. Now, these guys are tough. They could be tapping a lot sooner. But uh, <laughs> she's just not getting quite the angle on the arm to lock in the choke to where they could be choked unconscious. But they are, though they're not being choked unconscious or submitted, they are 
completely under her control. Now she switches the legs, goes to an arm bar here, and locks the arm. She could break a grown man's arm right there. It doesn't matter if you're Andre the Giant. You get that angle, you're going down. Now here she is standing up, and she pulls guard. She's got like a front guillotine choke. She's got like a, a guillotine choke. He's on his knee. Or she's trying to take his back and lock in a rear naked choke, but she's kind of slidden off the side because she made the mistake of not locking her hooks in. She realizes that and now throws a belly down arm bar. Very technical. He And she rolls over to her, her back and gets him submitted. So that was very, very, very high level jujitsu. Um, I would say she's minimally a purple belt and possibly even higher than that. I'm not, I, I can't say for certain, but um, your daughter, if she trains just for a year in jujitsu, she will be much, much further ahead in her, in her life and in her ability to defend herself than if she has no training. Okay, weight training, CrossFit, things like that, as useful and beneficial as they are to, to the health of a person, they really aren't going to help in a with a man. If you want to about, you know, gender being a uh, um, gender being a social construct, and really no differences between men and women. Nonsense. Nonsense. A 15-year-old boy, on the on average, can overpower a 15-year-old girl just in strength. And that gap gets wider the older they get. A 20-year-old boy versus a 20-year-old girl is much worse. The further you get away from like that puberty age, the more that gap widens. So jujitsu is the great equalizer. So let's transition now. I'm going to transition to talk about this book. Um, last time I did a show like this, I read from John Owen's book called Indwelling Sin and Believers. I read chapter one of that book, and I think that many people benefited from it. However, I think I'm, I'm almost putting the cart before the horse to go through a book like that. I want to go through Christian beliefs because this is more the meat and potatoes of Christianity. It's almost like a simplified systematic theology. There's other books out here similar to this. Um, you know, some authors are out there writing just to get their names out there, and they they make books similar to this one. This is the one I recommend. When I am talking to an unbeliever who has questions about the faith, I've given this book away several times. Um, so this is my go-to. Um, Wayne Grudem is the author. He also has a systematic theology if you really want to dig deep. But chapter one is what I want to go through you with you today. And chapter one is, what is the Bible? Now, just to kind of go through the different chapter titles here. This is 20 things you must believe and that you should know if you're a Christian. These are the things that kind of make up our common faith, right? So chapter one is, what is the Bible? Chapter two, what is God like? Chapter three, what is the Trinity? Chapter four, what is creation? Chapter five, what is prayer? So on and so forth. So let me just go to the book here, and I might come back with commentary here or there just to kind of um, fill in, you know, not to say that the guy's not thorough or anything, but, you know, I like to talk. I like to comment on things, so I'll just read from the book and comment where where uh, where I see fit. So, chapter one: What is the Bible? Any responsible look at a single Christian belief should be based on what God says about that subject. Therefore, as we begin to look at a series of basic Christian beliefs, it makes sense to start with the basis for these beliefs: God's words or the Bible. One topic the Bible thoroughly covers is itself. That is, the Bible tells us what God thinks about his, in his very word. God's opinion of his words can be broken down into four general categories. Authority, clarity, necessity, and sufficiency. So, uh, the first one, the authority of the Bible. 
all of the words of the Bible are God's words. Therefore, to disbelieve or disobey them is to disbelieve or disobey God himself. Oftentimes, passages in the Old Testaments are introduced with the phrase, quote, thus saith the Lord, unquote. See Exodus 4.22, Joshua 24.2, 1 Samuel 10, 18, Isaiah 10, 24, and also Deuteronomy 18, 18. This phrase, understood to be like the command of a king, indicated that what followed was to be obeyed without challenge or question. Even the words in the Old Testament not attributed as words. Paul in 2 Timothy 3, 16 makes this clear when he writes, all scripture is breathed out by God. The New Testament also affirms that its words are the very words of God. In 2 Peter 3.16, Peter refers to all of Paul's letters as part of the scriptures. This means that Peter and the early church considered Paul's writings to be in the same category as the Old Testament. Therefore, they, are, they considered Paul's writings to be the very words of God. In addition, Paul in 1 Timothy 5.18 writes that, quote, The scripture says two things, quote, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages, unquote. The first quote regarded, regarding an ox comes from the Old Testament. It is found in Deuteronomy 25.4. The second comes from the New Testament. It is found in Luke 10, 7. Paul, without any hesitation, quotes, quotes from both the Old and New Testaments, calling them both scripture. Therefore, again, the words of the New Testament are considered to be the very words of God. That is why Paul could write, quote, The things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. That's from 1 Corinthians 14, 37. Since the Old Testament writings... Since the Old and New Testament writings are both considered Scripture, it is right to, see, to say they are both the words of 2 Timothy 3.16, quote, breathed out by God. This makes sense when we consider Jesus' promise that the Holy Spirit would bring to the disciples remembrance all the things Jesus had said to them, John 14.26. It was as the disciples wrote the Spirit-enabled words, the Spirit-enabled words, that books such as Matthew, John, and First and Second Peter are written. The Bible says there are many ways, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, in which the actual words of the Bible were written. Sometimes God spoke directly to the author, who simply recorded what he heard, such as in Revelation 2, 1, 8, and 12. At other times, the author based much of his writings on interviews and research. See Luke 1, verses 1 through 3. At other times, the Holy Spirit brought to mind the things that Jesus taught. See John 14, 26. Regardless of the way the words came to the author, the words they put down were an extension of them, their personalities, skills, backgrounds, and training. But they were also exactly the words God wanted them to write, the very words that God claims are his own. If God claims that the words of Scripture are his own, then there is ultimately no higher authority one can appeal to for proof of this claim than Scripture itself. For what authority could be higher than God? So Scripture ultimately gains its authority from itself. But the claims of Scripture only become our personal convictions through the work of the Holy Spirit in an individual's heart. So, the Bible affirms its own authority. Well, that's a circular argument. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's a, uh, you can argue about the vicious, virtu the vicious versus virtuous circle um, on this. Um, but the point is that, that the claim of Scripture only become our personal convictions through the work of the Holy Spirit in an individual's heart. In other words, it's when, an, when the individual is regenerate or regenerated that the Holy Spirit convicts a sinner that the words of God are true. Until that happens, pretty much anyone will deny them. Back to the book, page 15. 
The Holy Spirit doesn't change the words of Scripture in any way. He doesn't supernaturally make them become the words of God, for they always have been. He does, however, change the reader of Scripture. The Holy Spirit makes the reader realize the Bible is unlike any book they have ever read. Through reading, they believe that the words of Scripture are the very words of God himself. It is as Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice and follow me. Other kinds of arguments, such as historical reliability, internal consistency, fulfilled prophecies, influence on others, and the majestic beauty and wisdom of the content can be useful in helping us see the reasonableness of the claims of the Bible. But me here now, but that is not sufficient. The Bible is sufficient, and and you come to that conviction through the Holy Spirit's um the Holy Spirit's indwelling of you as a believer. So in other words, as useful as these historical reliability and other arguments, they are not on par with Scripture. Okay? So, back to the book. As God's very words, the words of Scripture are more than simply true. They are truth itself, John 17, 17. They are the final measure by which all supposed truth is to be gauged. Therefore, that which conforms to Scripture is true. That which doesn't conform to Scripture is not true. New scientific or historical facts may cause us to re-examine our interpretation of Scripture, but they will never directly contradict the Scripture. So the Scripture is the measure for truth. If you are making a truth claim, a truth claim that does not match or comport with the Scriptures, it is therefore false. Well, how can you say that? On the authority of God's Word, on the authority of Scripture, my final and ultimate authority. So when the unbeliever asks you um, about these things and makes truth claims, you have to get to their ultimate authority. This is presuppositionalism 101, guys. This is presuppositionalism 101. That's the beauty. That's why I recommend this book so highly. So back to the book. The truth of the scriptures does not demand that the Bible reports events with exact scientific detail, though all the details it does report are true. Nor does it demand that the Bible tell us everything we need to know or ever could know about a subject. It never makes either of these claims. In addition, because it was written by ordinary men in an ordinary language with an ordinary style, it does contain loose or free quotations in some uncommon and unusual forms of grammar and spelling. But these are not matters of truthfulness. The Bible does not, in its original form, affirm anything contrary to fact. If the Bible does affirm anything contrary to fact, then it cannot be trusted. And if the Bible cannot be trusted, then God himself cannot be trusted. To believe the Bible affirms something false would be to disbelieve God himself. To disbelieve God himself is to place yourself as a higher authority with a deeper, more developed understanding on a topic or topics than God himself. Therefore, since the Bible affirms that to seek understanding, uh, we are to seek understanding those words, for in so doing, we are seeking to understand God Himself. We are to seek to trust the words of Scripture, for in doing so, we are seeking to trust God Himself. And we are seeking to obey the words of Scripture, and in so doing, we are seeking to obey God Himself. So that concludes the section on the Bible's authority. Now, <clears throat> Excuse me. So, the authority of the scripture is clear. The Bible itself lays out the scripture as authoritative. Um, we went through those verses, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Um, the different quotations from Paul and Peter um, that affirm as much that the scripture is our ultimate and final authority in all things faith and practice. Back to the book. The next section is called The Clarity of Scripture. Some people might throw around the word perspicuity. It's just another word for clarity. 
you know, so when someone talks about the doctrine of perspicuity, they're just talking about clarity. Back to the book. As we read scripture and seek to understand it, we discover that some passages are easier to understand than others. Although some passages may at first seem difficult to grasp, the Bible is written in such a way that all things necessary to become a Christian, live as Christian, and grow as a Christian are clear. There are some mysteries in Scripture, but they should not overwhelm us. For, quote, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, Psalm 17, Psalm 19.7. And the unfolding of God's words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, 130. God's word is so understandable and clear that even the simple can be made wise by it. Since the things of God are spiritually, spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, a proper understanding of scripture is often more than the result of an individual spiritual condition than it is his, his or her intellectual ability. Often the truth of scripture will appear to be folly to those who have rejected the claims of Jesus. And we see that ministry on the streets, on university campus, here on YouTube, you know that that is absolutely true. Back to the book. This does not mean, however, that every Bible-related misunderstanding is due to a person's spiritual condition. There are many, many godly Christian people who have greatly misunderstood some parts of Scripture. Often the disciples misunderstood what Jesus was talking about. See Matthew 15, 16, for example. Sometimes this was due to their hardened hearts. See Luke 24, 25. At other times, it was because they needed to wait for further events and understanding, John 12, 16. In addition, they did not always agree on the meanings of what was written in Scripture. See Acts 15 and Galatians 2, 11 through 15 for examples of this. When individuals disagree on the portion of a passage of Scripture, the problem does not lie for God guided its composition so that it could be understood. Rather, the problem lies within us. Sometimes, as a result of our own shortcomings, we fail to properly understand what the Bible is specifically teaching. Even so, we should prayerfully read the Bible, asking the Lord to reveal the truth of His Word to us. Now, all mankind suffers from the noetic effect of sin. Every aspect of our being is tainted by sin. That's what that means. When we talk about the noetic effect of the fall, that means that every aspect, our mind, our heart, our intellect, our intentions, this is like your Genesis 6 stuff, right? Genesis 6, that every aspect of us is tainted by sin, including our intellect and our mind, which means we may not understand things clearly. That doesn't bring into question the clarity of the scriptures. In fact, we, we know that the things that one must believe to be saved about who Jesus is, man's condition before God, and the purpose for why Christ had to die on the cross, his, his victorious resurrection, um, defeating sin. We know that those things are clear. Even unbelievers can read the gospel accounts of the passion and understand what's going on there. But it talks about that uh, in this book here, it talks about that a proper understanding of Scripture is often more the result of an individual spiritual condition than his or her intellectual ability. So it's a heart condition. And I think that can be true for unbelie or for believers as well, that sometimes there's a heart condition that makes them reject some of the plain teachings of Scripture about God's sovereignty, um, the total and complete inability of man. I think sometimes that is a, a condition of the heart for a believer as well, though they may still affirm the necessities of the faith. Speaking of necessity, Back to the book. The next section is the necessity of Scripture. It is not only true that all things necessarily to all things necessary to become a Christian, live as a Christian, and grow as a Christian are clearly presented in the Bible. It is also true that without the Bible, we could not know these things. 
The necessity of Scripture means that it is necessary to read the Bible or have someone tell us what is in the Bible if we're going to know God personally, have our sins forgiven, and know without and know with certainty what God wants us to do. Paul hints at this when he asks how anyone can hear about becoming a Christian, quote, without someone preaching, Romans 10, verse 14. For, quote, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. If there is no one preaching the word of Christ, Paul says, people won't be saved. And that word comes from the scriptures. So in order to know how to become a Christian, ordinarily one must either be read a one must either read about it in the Bible or have someone else explain what the Bible says about it. As Paul told Timothy, quote, the sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.15. But the Christian life doesn't only start with the Bible, for it, is also, for it also thrives through the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, quote, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, unquote. Just as our physical lives are maintained by daily nourishment with physical food, so our spiritual lives are maintained by daily nourishment with the word of God. To neglect regular reading of the Bible is detrimental to the health of our souls. In addition, the Bible is our only source for clear and definite statements about God's will. While God has not revealed all aspects of his will to us, quote, for the secret things belong to the Lord our God, unquote, there are many aspects of his will revealed to us through the scriptures that we all may do the words of his law, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Love for God is demonstrated commandments, 1 John 5, 3, and his commandments are found where? In the passages of Scripture. While the Bible is necessary for many things, it is not needed for knowing some things about God, his character, and his moral laws. For, quote, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the, spy above, the sky above proclaims his handiwork, Psalm 19, 1. Paul says that even the wicked... Quote, what can be known about is made plain to them because God has shown it to them. Romans 1.19 Not only do the wicked know of God and about God, but they also have their minds and consciences and some understanding of God's moral laws. Romans 1.32, Romans 2.14 and 15. Therefore, this general revelation about God's existence, character, and moral law is given to all people. It is seen through nature, God's historical work, and an inner sense that God has placed in everyone. It's called general revelation because it is given to all people in general. It is distinct from the Bible. By contrast, special revelation is God's revelation to specific people. The entire Bible is special revelation, and so are the direct messages from God to the prophets and others as recorded in the Bible's historical stories. Sorry, my nose itches here. So, God reveals enough to mankind in general revelation. He reveals what he reveals about himself is sufficient for their condemnation. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that man suppresses the truth about God and his own sin, and they do so in their unrighteousness. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness because God has, has made himself known to them clearly through the created order. You look at creation and you naturally say, there's a creator. But then, because of hatred for God and love for sin, people create devices for themselves, such as things like evolution to uh, deny the truth of God's existence. That's where the scripture comes in, right? That's where the scripture comes in, and that's where the preacher specifically comes in, to tell people about Jesus Christ and why he came to forgive sin. He came to forgive the sin that you are using to suppress the truth about God and call yourself an atheist, for example. Um, 
and he has given us as Christians the responsibility to preach that word to unbelievers, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if anyone is going to be saved, it has to be through special revelation, through the scripture, and or through the preaching of that word. Not man-made methodologies. If you listen to Bible Thumping Wingnut, you heard me and Tim talking about the Focus on the Family episode and the horse ranch, and that they have the nerve to call that ministry and evangelism, and it's not. It's not. When you look at the apostolic examples of evangelism throughout the New Testament, what you see is men preaching the Bible. And guess what Bible they had then? The Old Testament. The New Testament was being formed and created as they were preaching. So back to the book, we're going to talk about the sufficiency of Scripture here. And this is really where the rubber meets the road, all right? So the sufficiency of Scripture. I'm going to just kind of scoop my chair up here so I can sit back a little bit more comfortably and not hunch over. So, the sufficiency of Scripture. Although those alive during the Old Testament period didn't have the benefit of God's complete revelation, which is found in the New Testament, they had access to all the words of God that He intended them to have during their lives. Today, the Bible contains all the words of God that a person needs to become a Christian live as a Christian, and grow as a Christian. In order to be blameless before God, we just have to obey his word. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the way of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 1. In the Bible, God has given us instructions that equip us for every good work that he wants us to do. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This means to say that scripture is sufficient. Consequently, it is in Scripture alone that we search for God's words to us, and we should eventually arrive at contentment with what we find there. The sufficiency of Scripture should encourage through the Bible to try to find what God would have us think about a certain issue and or do in a certain situation. Everything that God wants to tell us, wants to tell all his people for all time, about that kind of issue or situation will be found in the pages of the Bible. Directly answer can think of, for the secret things belong to the Lord our God, Deuteronomy 29, 29. It will provide us with the guidance that we need for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 17. When we don't find the specific answer to a specific question in the Bible, we are not free to add to the commands of Scripture what we have found to be pragmatically correct. It is certainly possible that God will give us specific guidance in particular day-to-day -day situations, but we do not have license to place on par with Scripture any modern revelations, leadings, or other forms of guidance that we believe to be from God. Nor should we ever seek to impose such guidance on other Christians generally or on other people in our churches, since we can be wrong about such guidance and God never wants us to give of his words in the Bible. There are issues and situations for which God has not provided the precise direction or rules that we sometimes desire. But because Scripture is sufficient, we do not have the right to add to its commands or teachings. For example, while it may be appropriate for one church to meet at a certain time on Sunday morning, it could be completely appropriate for another church to meet at a different time because the Bible does not speak directly to the issue of Sunday service times. If one church told another they needed to meet at a certain hour, that church would be in sin and would not be, deemed, uh, would not be demonstrating a belief in the sufficiency of Scripture. In the same way, with regard to living the Christian life, the sufficiency of Scripture reminds us that nothing is sin that is not forbidden by Scripture, either explicitly or by implication. Therefore, we are not to add prohibitions where we don't believe Scripture is precise enough. From time to time, for example, there may be situations where it is inappropriate for Christians to drink caffeine, attend a movie, Eat meat offered to idols, for example, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, 1, 8, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. 
But since there isn't a, any specific teaching on the rules of Scripture that forbids these actions by all Christians at all times, these activities are not in and of themselves sinful. Therefore, in our doctrinal, ethical, and moral teachings and beliefs, we should be content with what God has told us in the Scripture. God has revealed exactly what He knows is right for us. Many differences have divided churches and denominations are issues that the Bible places little emphasis on. Many individual conclusions on issues like the proper form of church government, the exact nature of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper, the exact nature and order of events surrounding Christ's return are drawn more from skillful, skillful inference than direct biblical statements. One should, therefore, exhibit a humble hesitancy in placing more emphasis on many of these issues than the Bible does. Thus concludes chapter one of Christian beliefs. Now, with all of that said, why? Why is, isn't it interesting that chapter one is about the scripture? Just as in many confessions of faith, for example, um, the focus is on like the first clause and all like the Westminster, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, for example, the like Article One, Chapter One is on the sufficiency and the authority of Scripture. Everything else about lies on that. That's why this book starts out talking about scripture because it is the sure foundation upon which the rest of this book is built. So when we get into chapter two and we talk about who God is, well, what do you think is going to be the basis and the foundation for that? Uh, the scripture. What is the Trinity? Scripture. It all comes back to scripture. So you may ask yourself the question, or you may even ask me the question if you're an unbeliever. <clears throat> How can I know the Bible is true? To which I will respond, what is truth? If you deny the scripture, if you deny the God of the Bible, your definition of truth is by its very definition, nothing more than subjective, for all we know, gibberish. You have no absolute truth. And we know that that's a major inconsistency. The fact that absolute truth exists demonstrates that God exists and that his word is true. So with that, I hope you enjoyed my podcast. I hope you enjoyed my first live version here on YouTube. I think those of you who persevered, I know we had some issues with the screen sharing on the videos. And again, apologies for the, the swearing in the Joe Rogan section. I may go through and try to bleep those out if time allows me to um, or remove them altogether. But nonetheless, I appreciate you guys listening. If you have any questions, please email me at grapplingwiththeology at gmail.com. I want to thank someone emailed um, and you, you, I addressed your emails in an earlier podcast, um, thanking me for continuing with the work of grappling with theology. And it's my pleasure. Uh, please, if, if this ministry blesses you, I don't need any money. I don't need anything for me. prayers and shares. So pray for me and share this on your social media. Um, leave me a rating and review on iTunes, and if you lis listen on Android, whatever um, podcast app you're listening through, feel free to leave a rating and review for me there as well. Um, don't forget we are a member of the Bible Thumping Wingnut Podcast Network, and don't forget to support our sponsors, Deus Fight Company. Go to deusfight.com. That's D E U. S like Sam, not F like Frank. S like Sam, deusfight.com. Deus is Portuguese for God, by the way. And Portuguese because that's what they speak in Brazil. So go to deusfight.com, use coupon code GWT, that's golf whiskey tango for you military folks, and you'll get a 10% discount. And go to R R R R R Wrath and Grace. 
wrathandgrace.com for your custom screen printing, for Christian wear, for hip hop, for all of it. Go check out their YouTube channel too. Excellent content. Excellent. You'll love it. You'll love it. So with that, guys, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And thanks for all your support. Thanks for all the feedback. And uh, until next time, y'all, keep on rolling. <laughs>